Good evening, I'm John Yang. Judy Woodruff is away on the news hour tonight. It is tragic that the president's reckless actions make impeachment necessary. He gave us no choice. A day for history. For only the third time since the country's founding, the House takes up a vote of impeachment against the American president. We break down today's historic vote, what it means, and what to expect as the Senate prepares to put President Trump on trial. Then on the ground in California, ahead of tomorrow's NewsHour Politico Democratic presidential debate, where climate change is a top concern for Golden State Democrats. And stepping toward the future, medicine at the edge of current knowledge sparks hope for those paralyzed by spinal cord injuries. You put weight back on the legs, you get them extended, you get the trunk upright, and the spinal circuitry says, oh, I know what that is, that's standing. I know how to do that. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. Major funding for the PBS NewsHour has been provided by for 160 years. BNSF, the engine that connects us. Consumer Cellular. Supporting social entrepreneurs and their solutions to the world's most pressing problems. Skollfoundation.org. The Lemelson Foundation, committed to improving lives through invention in the U.S. and developing countries. On the web at lemelson.org. Supported by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. And with the ongoing support of these institutions. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. The House of Representatives is facing its moment of truth this evening, the impeachment of President Trump. The charges, abuse of power and obstruction of Congress. Our coverage begins with Congressional Correspondent Lisa Desjardins telling us about this momentous day. The House will be in order. Perhaps it was the specter of history. Today marks a sad day for America. Or the high stakes involved. This president, elected by the American people, has violated his oath of office and violated the rule of law. Our president is, as we speak, abusing his power and placing himself above the law. Or perhaps a sense that the die was already cast. Since Donald Trump was elected in 2016, Democrats have been on a crusade to stop him by any means. In the House chamber today, weeks of fiery words over hypothetical impeachment turned somber and serious when lawmakers faced the reality. I solemnly and sadly opened the debate on the impeachment of the President of the United States. Speaker Nancy Pelosi wore a large brooch of the House mace, a symbol of the power of the Speaker of the House, as she charged that the president has undermined his office. If we do not act now, we would be derelict in our duty. It is tragic that the president's reckless actions make impeachment necessary. He gave us no choice. Democrats laid out their argument that President Trump abused his power, using his office to pressure Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky into opening investigations that would help Mr. Trump politically. Jim McGovern of Massachusetts. Our inquiry is simply to answer the following question. Did President Trump and his top advisors corruptly withhold official government actions to obtain an improper advantage in the next election? We now know through the hard work of our investigative committees and because of the president's own admission that the answer to that question is yes. And Pramila Jayapal of Washington State. 
the president told us himself on national television exactly what he wanted from the phone call with President Zelensky. He came onto the White House lawn and he said, I wanted President Zelensky to open an investigation into the Bidens. He solicited foreign interference before, he is doing it now, and he will do it again. The president is the smoking gun. But Republicans portrayed President Trump as the victim here, offering several counter arguments. First, assailing Democrats' evidence as incomplete. Tom Cole of Oklahoma. My, my colleagues in the majority believe they have proven their case. Let me be clear, they have not. The entire premise of these articles of impeachment rests on a pause placed on Ukrainian security assistance, a pause of 55 days. The majority has spun creative narratives as to the meaning and the motive of, their, of this pause, alleging the president demanded a, quote, quid pro quo, unquote, uh, but with no factual evidence to back it up. Argument two from Republicans, that Speaker Pelosi and House Democrats are motivated by politics, not principle. Utah's Chris Stewart. This vote this day is about one thing and one thing only. They hate this president. They hate those of us who voted for him. They think we're stupid. They think we made a mistake. They think Hillary Clinton should be the president, and they want to fix that. That's what this vote is about. They want to take away my vote and throw it in the trash. Of and Americans. Florida's Ross Spano. But the American people see through this sad charade for what it is, an attempt to undo the 2016 election based on hearsay and opinion, not fact. This is incredibly divisive and has lowered the bar for what future presidents will face. I strongly oppose the articles before us today, and I hope that we will finally move past this nightmare. The rhythm of the day was partisan, but the tone was less caustic than recently, even as Republicans repeated the president's bottom line. This impeachment is a total joke and a total sham. And Democrats repeated that for them, this is about principle and protecting the future. To my friends on the other side of the aisle, I say this. This is not about making history. This is about holding a lawless president accountable in the way our framers intended. As the House debated his fate, President Trump blasted out his response on Twitter, writing of atrocious lies by what he called the radical left, an assault on America and an assault on the Republican Party. Outside the Capitol, some voters loudly disagree. Hundreds of pro-impeachment demonstrators rallied in the cold Washington morning. That followed last night's nationwide protests, including in San Francisco, represented by Speaker Pelosi, and New Orleans, where protesters stood outside Republican Whip Steve Scalise's office. Now, early in the day, Republicans tried some parliamentary moves to voice their objections to this process, but I'm told they do not plan to have any more motions like that. What that means, John, is we are likely in the final hour or so of debate. We expect votes soon, and we do expect it to be largely partisan, with the exception of perhaps two or so Democrats who may vote with Republicans. Lisa, as we take a live look at what's happening on the uh, House floor right now, I want to ask you, this is one of those days uh, where, Lisa, you had a front row seat to history. Give us, give the viewers some idea what it was like in the chamber, what it was like on Capitol Hill that they could not see and hear. Well, as our viewers have no doubt felt, this has been an incredibly turbulent and dramatic story for the past two months. But, John, today felt strangely like the moment after a storm, where lawmakers felt weary to some degree. They didn't feel like they were at sort of their high-tempered selves. They had more of a moment of pause. It was an unusual feeling, but one that was more reflective than I've seen in the past. Also noteworthy, John, today you could see the full skills of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi on display. It wasn't evident to, to those uh, who saw the camera shots, but she the whole time, or much of the time, was on the House floor, sitting, talking with her members, didn't look like she was twisting elbows as much as doing what she does well, keeping in very close touch with her caucus, which I think is how she's been able to keep them unified on something that is not an easy vote for all of her members. Lisa, I'm going to ask you to stay right there, just steps away from the House chamber while we introduce the rest of our panel here at the desk where they have been since 9 this morning. News Hour Foreign Affairs correspondent Nick Schifrin, who has been anchoring our special coverage of today's uh, proceedings. 
Mika Oyang, Vice President of the National Security Program at Third Way, a Washington think tank, and former House Intelligence Subcommittee staff director when the Democrats were in the majority. And Michael Allen, Managing Director at the advisory, uh, advisory firm Beacon Global Strategies and former staff director of the House Intelligence Committee when the Republicans held the majority. And from the Washington Post newsroom, Bob Costa, moderator of Washington Week and a post-national political correspondent. Thank you all for being here all day long in many cases. Bob, I want to start with you. We've been able to watch the proceedings on the floor all day long. What have you been able to learn about what the president's day was like? Just minutes ago, the New York Times photographer Doug Mills uh, published a photo of the president before he headed out to the helicopter to then head on Air Force One to Michigan for tonight's rally. And it was a black and white photo that showed the president scowling. And talking to the president's closest confidants today and top Republicans, it's clear that President Trump throughout the day was following the proceedings at the Capitol, closely keeping tabs on who was speaking against him, who was speaking in support of him. But he was also looking ahead to tonight's rally. And he is planning to give a grievance-filled speech tonight to his core voters, looking not just at what happened today in Congress, but ahead to the 2020 campaign. Inside the White House, already the focus is on how to turn impeachment into an issue to galvanize his own voters in 2020. So we're likely to hear more about this even beyond the trial, after the trial ends in January. It will not end. Because impeachment now is, of course, historic, but it's historic in the sense that it's happening just before a presidential campaign season. And President Trump wants to run away from this in part. He doesn't like his own personal brand being associated with impeachment. But his political advisors are telling him he can use impeachment as a cudgel against Democrats if he can find a way to explain it as an anti-establishment mood uh, that is forming against him. And he wants to use that sentiment to get his voters out in the Republican Party. Uh, but there is some personal uh, grousing behind the scenes today, Trump associates tell me, that the president just doesn't love his name, his name that he so prizes, was central to his business enterprises, now being stained through history by the word impeachment. Uh, Mika and Michael, you both spent time on the Hill. You've seen big moments uh, in the House. Mika, I want to start with you. How did you think the Republicans and Democrats used their time today in this debate, the message that they, uh, they uh, delivered, the arguments that they made? So what you saw today between the Democrats and the Republicans was very different messaging. Democrats calling back to history, quoting Alexander Hamilton, talking about founding principles of the country. And I think what they are trying to do there is to make a case to swing voters, right? These are voters that were necessary to build the Democrats' majority. And you saw in a number of those districts that had flipped from Republican to Democrat in the 2018 midterm election, those members coming out in favor of impeachment on a national security case. So you saw that very much reflected in what they were doing in contrast to Republicans who, as Bob noted, we're really arguing about grievance and victimization for the president, using very loaded language, trying to really fire up the base. Michael, what, did you, what, what was your takeaway? Well, usually we're used in the House of Representatives to seeing emotion and passion. Today, they acted more like senators, in my estimation. They were very careful. They made solemn arguments. Um, but the messaging was also very, very tight. From the Democrats, I heard over and over that the president solicited foreign interference for personal gain and hurt national security. And from the Republicans, I heard the following formulation over and over. It's that it's politics, it's a sham process, and they're trying to overturn the election. So all in all, I thought they were all flying in formation, trying to message their base and the larger country about what they're doing tonight. And perhaps a preview of what each side is going to be saying in the Senate during the trial? I think so. I think you'll see in the Senate in particular a lot of the grievance-style politics that we've heard so far. It will slow down, of course, because it'll be more like a trial and less like an indictment that we'll see tonight. Nick, they both mentioned the, the, the sec national security arguments. I mean, that where we got here, or how we got here, rather, 
was because of a phone call about Ukraine, about uh, the, giving aid to Ukraine. Did we hear much about that today? We, we did not. You know, there was not a lot of focus of what brought this about, uh, and, and not a lot of focus of the importance of this policy. John, as you and I have talked about, Ukraine is the only country in Europe at war, and, and the Trump administration had a policy, and that was different than the president's policy on Ukraine over the last six months. And that's how I see it. You know, a couple years ago, the Trump administration decided to help Ukraine, sending more offensive weapons that the Obama administration did not, increase dollar amounts, maintain support for Ukrainian reformers who were trying to end corruption in the country. There was bipartisan support for that, and that dreaded word, interagency consensus for Ukraine. Fast forward to this year. Rudy Giuliani leads a different policy, questioning military aid and changing the focus of corruption to Joe Biden's son, who was on the board of the largest energy company in Ukraine, and a discredited theory on Ukraine being involved in the 2016 hacking. And that's what led to that July 25th phone call and that often quoted phrase, do us a favor, though. And what happened was the president or, or aides around him froze military aid. They conditioned a White House meeting on President Zelensky of Ukraine and Ukraine overall doing those specific corruption investigations. What Democrats say is that freeze, that withholding, that's an abuse of power because that's the president elevating his own interests over national security. Republicans say aid was delivered in the end and the president was right to question all kinds of corruption in Ukraine. Uh, Lisa, you, this is, process is still going on. The action's still going on on the, uh, uh, the House floor. Give us a sense of what's going to happen in the next uh, several hours, couple of hours, and then what happens beyond that. That's right. This debate will wind up. I think we will see um, some of both sides who they feel are their strongest speakers in the next hour, potentially. And then we will move to votes expected. They will split this single resolution into two votes, on one on each article of impeachment. We do expect those votes to be somewhat different. At least one Democratic member, uh, Jared Golden of Maine, has said he will vote yes on one and no on the other. After that, we also expect a resolution uh, on who the House Democrats would like to appoint as their managers, who essentially will be their prosecutors when this goes to the Senate. So we're looking to that as well. And then here's the big question tonight, John. There is some talk by a few Democrats of holding on to these articles of impeachment even after they've passed, not transmitting to them to the Senate right away as a negotiating tactic to try and change the Senate rules. That is a remarkable idea, I, and there's a lot of debate about whether it could even work, but the next step after this would be to transmit those articles. It's not clear when House Speaker Nancy Pelosi will do that, and it is a matter of discussion tonight as to when that will happen. Help us understand that, Lisa. You, you, by delaying the transmission over across, across the uh, building to the Senate, what would that do? That would delay the, the, uh, the Senate trial? Well, as I said, this is an untested, I think perhaps the panel will um, agree, idea. But the idea is that Mitch McConnell wants a trial to happen without much delay, and the House could use that as leverage withholding those uh, articles, leaving that hanging over the Senate and the president until McConnell allows, say, more of the witnesses that Democrats want. But knowing how Leader McConnell works, I, I haven't seen him bow to that kind of pressure in the past. I, I don't. I think this could be a strange cat and mouse game that these Democrats are playing. It is. It is a small group of Democrats. It is not clear at all if House Speaker Pelosi agrees with this idea. But it is something in the air. We're going to watch. It will be important when they transmit these articles. Michael and Mika, you Hill veterans. Do you have any sense of what the parliamentary gamesmanship here is? I mean this has not happened before, so we're really in uncharted territory in terms of articles of impeachment timing. But I would just note that the political calendar starts to change once you get out of January. You start impacting the Democratic primaries. You start getting into filing deadlines for senators. So a delay could have some political ramifications. Taking hostages in legislative log rolling is as old as the Republic. But if you take a hostage, you got to be willing to shoot the hostage. And when Mitch McConnell doesn't want the impeachment bill coming over, I can't see, like Lisa, a situation where he's negotiating down what he wants to do in order to get impeachment sped up to the, to the Senate. Uh, Bob Costa, I want to ask you, what are you hearing from the White House about 
the White House's participation in the trial uh, in the Senate, uh, whether um, uh, how much they're going to participate. They said they didn't want to participate in the House uh, impeachment proceedings, uh, but what are they going to do when they come to trial in the Senate? There is an appetite within the White House to call some witnesses like Hunter Biden and Vice President Biden uh, to be part of that trial. But it's unlikely that that's going to happen because the White House is not just going to get what it wants or what White House Counsel Pat Cipollone wants. It's going to come down to what 51 senators in the Republican majority, perhaps some Democrats agree, should be the rules outlining how this trial unfolds. And for now, when I was up at the Capitol this week, senators like Susan Collins of Maine, a moderate up in 2020, Senator Mitt Romney of Utah, a more moderate Republican, have told me and other reporters that they want to see a, a trial that plays out in a civil way, that even though it's a political exercise, has the feeling of a trial. They want to take it seriously. So the White House will want to direct this to some extent, but it will be the senators driving the process. And, and you're going to see the White House try to nudge Mitch McConnell, the majority leader, at some point to maybe dismiss the trial, adjourn the trial, to move to a vote. Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky, a, the president's ally, told me he may move to call for a vote two weeks into the trial or maybe even a week in if he feels he, he's heard enough. So that conservative clamor is something that's on my radar. And, Bob, the, the talk about calling witnesses. Was uh, Senator Schumer's uh, attempt uh, sort of an opening bid in this uh, negotiation or, or gamesmanship asking for White House witnesses like uh, John Bolton, Mick Mulvaney, uh, the acting chief of staff, uh, essentially saying, okay, you want witnesses, you want Hunter Biden, you want Joe Biden, well, we want these guys. I would not frame it as gamesmanship. Senator Schumer, whether you uh, loathe him or support him politically, he is someone who represents the Democratic view, a culmination of frustration on the Democratic side with the White House's refusal to provide witnesses to Congress as they investigate the president's conduct. And Senator Schumer is reflecting the, the calls from so many Democrats to try to hear a firsthand account from Secretary Pompeo, Ambassador John Bolton, the former national security advisor, about President Trump's role in the Ukraine episode, what exactly he did and what others did in terms of uh, asking the, the budget to be held off and the spending to be held off. So many facts remain and questions remain unanswered at this point. And so Senator Schumer, of course, he would like to see President Trump defeated. He's an opponent of President Trump politically, but he also wants to hear more of this story. Bob Cost at The Washington Post, Lisa Desjardins on post as always at the uh, U.S. Capitol. Michael Allen, Mika Oyang, Nick Schifrin, thank you very much. Thank you. As we've been saying, today's House proceedings are only the third time that body has debated impeaching a president. So where does all this fit in the historical context? Beverly Gage is a professor of history and American studies at Yale University, which is where she is tonight. Uh, professor Gage, thanks so much for joining us. The historical aspect of this, how does what's going on now compare with previous impeachments? Not so much with the specifics of what the presidents are being charged or the allegations against the presidents, but the political environment, the political struggles uh, around these uh, proceedings. We've been a moment like this a few more times in American history. So in the 1860s, the Andrew Johnson impeachment, of course, Watergate in the 1970s, and then the impeachment of Bill Clinton in the 1990s. And I would say what they have in common is that in each of those cases, we saw very particular battles about very particular events the actual charges that were brought in impeachment proceedings uh, were about very specific acts, but they all took place within really a larger set of political conflicts. And those political acts, uh, those acts that were so central to the impeachment proceedings, really tended to fit into narratives that uh, critics certainly already had about each of these presidents. And I think that's the case with Trump as well. Is there something you can see about the, the differences in the political atmospheres, the sort of the criticisms that were already present uh, about how the way that those presidents have responded uh, to what was going on and how their, their parties responded to what was going on? 
Yeah, I think our best point of reference is really Watergate in the 1970s, which is long enough ago to see some pretty big differences and really structural changes that have happened in American politics. You know, in certain ways, Trump and Nixon are quite similar political figures in terms of uh, their personalities, their combativeness uh, toward their political critics. But I think we're in a very different atmosphere in a lot of ways. Uh, if you look at the 1970s, uh, the parties had a lot more overlap in terms of ideology. They were a lot less national, so the structure of the parties was different. Uh, the structure of the media was really different. There wasn't any Fox News, and there wasn't something like Twitter where the president was able to really directly get his message out. Uh, and you see a lot of other structural differences already in kind of how impeachment proceedings are going along. Uh, we're seeing a lot less use of the courts now than we saw under Nixon. And of course, uh, politically, one of the big questions is how this is going to affect uh, the 2020 election, both in the 1970s and the 1990s. You were talking about presidents who had already been reelected to second terms. And here we have this uh, big reelection question really hanging over the entire affair. You talk about Watergate. It was the Republicans who told President Nixon it was time to go. But then in the uh, the more recent cases, you know, President Clinton and uh, President Trump, we've had their parties rallying around their president. Does that speak to the nature of the allegations against them, or does that speak to the political atmosphere of the times? I think it speaks to a little of each. We do have a story of Watergate in which, you know, that was a very, very long process uh, from the middle of 1972 when the burglary actually happened uh, all the way through to August of 1974 when Nixon finally resigned. And actually, for most of that time, the Republican Party stuck very fiercely with Nixon as the Democrats did with Clinton and as the Republicans appear to be doing with Trump as well. Um, I think what happened in 19. 74 is really that Nixon had taken a stand that he had not participated in the burglary, he had not participated in the cover-up. And so when the tapes finally came out showing that, in fact, he had quite explicitly been lying, uh, that was a, a genuine shock to many of his Republican allies. And at that moment, but very, very late in the process, uh, they suggested they were going to turn on him. Trump has taken a very, very different approach to the whole thing uh, by saying, yes, of course, I did the things that you are suggesting that I did, but they're perfectly fine. Um, so we might have new revelations. And in fact, I think we will as this continues. Uh, but it's a very different strategy, very different set of tactics coming out of the White House. In the first 220 years of this nation, we had only one president face, this, uh, face an impeachment proceeding. Now we're having the second in about 20 years and the third in about 45 years. What does that say? What, what as a historian, uh, what do you think that says? Well, I think it's partly that uh, after the Johnson impeachment, the particular politics of Reconstruction were so specific to that moment, what was happening in the Republican Party, the reentry of the South, um, that it didn't have a lot of parallels uh, over the next century and, and didn't tend to look to impeachment for an option. Uh, of course, since Nixon, uh, we've seen these three sets of impeachment proceedings, Nixon, Clinton, and now Trump. Um, and I do think that they have fed on each other a little bit. Some of it is just that the pace of our politics is different, uh, but we are seeing heightened levels of partisanship and the fact that we're getting a little bit of a, of a kind of tit-for-tat situation, though a lot of people in the end recognize the legitimacy of Watergate. Uh, there was always a core of Republicans who felt that it was uh, a witch hunt, an unfair attack on the presidency. Uh, some of those folks were the ones who went on the attack against Bill Clinton. And then, of course, the Clinton impeachment really set a precedent uh, for a highly partisan uh, set of processes that now uh, different people are looking back to as their primary point of reference. Pres President Clinton, of course, acquitted in the Senate. It looks like uh, that President Trump would probably be acquitted in the Senate. Has the nature of impeachment changed? Has it now become not this rare event, but become a tool in the partisan arsenal? 
I think that that's partly a fair characterization. I mean, one of the strange things about our history of impeachment is that actually it's never worked. Um, so Johnson was impeached but stayed in office. Uh, Nixon was about to be impeached, but he resigned, so didn't go through the full impeachment and trial process. Bill Clinton was, in fact, impeached and put on trial, but also remained in office. Um, and so I think we are seeing it being used to some degree as a partisan tool, but we're also seeing it uh, you know, as a check uh, for rule of law, for other uh, more principled aspects. But uh, it doesn't seem like it's going to be terribly effective uh, in terms of removing the president from office, in this case, as it, as it really hasn't been in the past. Beverly Gage of Yale University, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. There is other news tonight. A federal appeals court has struck down part of Obamacare, but it stopped short of throwing out the entire law. The three-judge panel in New Orleans today agreed with a lower court in Texas that the individual mandate to buy health insurance is unconstitutional. Congress had already gutted that provision. The rest of the law goes back to the lower court for further review. A New York judge has dropped state charges of mortgage fraud against former Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort. That indictment was widely seen as an attempt to keep Manafort in prison, even if President Trump pardons him for his federal crimes. Manafort is now serving a seven-year sentence for those convictions, which are linked to the Russia investigation. In Australia, unprecedented summer heat gripped the continent for a second day. The nationwide average temperature on Tuesday was 105 degrees Fahrenheit, the hottest on record. Today, temperatures in some places reached 118 degrees. The heat wave has helped fuel dozens of wildfires. Elsewhere, children played in fountains and many families took to local beaches. Experts said the readings are extraordinary by any standard. It's incredible, these national average maximum temperature records. You normally only break them by just a very small margin, but we broke uh, the previous one back in January 13 by uh, 0.6 of a degree. Meanwhile, in Russia, Moscow saw unusually warm temperatures despite the onset of winter. It was almost 43 degrees when it's usually in the 20s. That made it the city's warmest December 18th since 1886. Back in this country, immigrants claiming asylum in the United States may face more restrictions. A new federal regulation would bar asylum claims from anyone convicted of illegally re-entering the country, committing domestic violence, or driving drunk. It's the Trump administration's latest effort to curb the flow of migrants. The proposal is subject to public comment before it can take effect. The Trump administration laid out proposals today to allow the importation of cheaper drugs from abroad. One rule would let states bring in brand name drugs from Canada under federal oversight. The other lets manufacturers import cheaper versions of their own drugs from any country. It's still unclear when the proposals would go into effect. Fiat Chrysler and PSA Peugeot signed a merger deal today to form the world's fourth largest automaker. The new company will produce more than eight and a half million cars a year with revenues of nearly $190 billion. The company said they plan to invest more in low emissions and new driving techni technologies. On Wall Street today, the Dow Jones Industrial Average lost 27 points to close at 28,239. The Nasdaq rose four points, and the S&P 500 slipped one point. Still to come on the news hour, on the ground in California, where Democratic voters are getting a close look at their party's presidential candidates. A breakthrough treatment for spinal cord injuries offers results once considered impossible. And students from around the country share their questions for the candidates in tomorrow's NewsHour Politico debate. And my question for the candidates. This is the PBS NewsHour from WETA Studios in Washington and in the West from the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University. California is the nation's most populous state, and with more than 400 delegates at stake, it is a big prize in the Democratic presidential primary. This year, state officials have moved up voting to March 3rd, Super Tuesday. National correspondent Stephanie Tsai traveled to Southern California to hear what voters there have to say. Around picnic tables and kitchen counters, California voters are torn between hope. I'm very confident that we'll move in, the, in a better direction. 
I'm, and fear. I'm really fearful for, for our democracy. Among this set of Democrats in the Los Angeles suburb of South Whittier, the talk is grounded in the experience that comes from a life long lived. So I'm with a candidate that is being realistic. These are voters less moved by vision and big ideas, but attentive to policy specifics. We want a private choice. I like the fact that uh, people should have options. Kathy, Elias, Joyous, and Jan are all undecided, but former Vice President Biden feels like a safe fallback. We need someone who can defeat Trump, and right now, I'm certainly leaning with Biden, although I'm such a strong feminist, it hurts me. Will you be voting on March 3rd in the primary? At a millennial phone bank event in Westwood, a stark contrast. The under 30 voters are more interested in who inspires them, and most have made up their mind. I have my candidate that I've chosen, Pete Buttigieg. I think I'm going to support Elizabeth Warren. For decades, the state of California has been mostly an afterthought for Democratic primary candidates. But this year, with its earlier primary, the Golden State could be decisive. Voters will get their vote by mail ballots the night of the Iowa caucuses. Hello, Los Angeles! It's why more than in the past, candidates have been coming to the state courting voters and holding rallies, not just fundraisers, says longtime political analyst Christina Bellantoni. We used to vote in June, and by doing it in March, the idea was that you're right after, you know, the first four traditional voting and caucusing states, you can have a significant impact. The candidate who wins here in the largest state in the country will, in all likelihood, win the nomination. But the most populous state is notoriously difficult to run a campaign in. It's a lot of ground to cover and a unique set of challenges. Reaching that number of voters is just so expensive. I mean, you could spend $20 million on television ads in California and not really make a dent. But despite the hurdles, many California Democrats, like working mom Amanda Notke, are energized. I mean, I'm excited. We're spoiled for choice in a lot of ways. Amanda was among a small contingent of Senator Elizabeth Warren supporters gathered for a Sunday morning beach cleanup in Santa Monica. There's been a lot of talk about which candidate would do better um, in the general election, a progressive candidate or a moderate. Yeah. Uh, where do you fall when it comes to electability? Um, I want someone that is electable, but I feel like Elizabeth Warren is the best of both worlds. She's smart. She has plans, she is a progressive, but I think she also knows the Senate and she knows Congress and she knows how to get things through. Okay, thank you, adios. And back at the phone bank in Westwood, Rachel Bracker says this is a pivotal moment. It feels like we're kind of on the cusp of something where our country can either go towards a more progressive future, where we're doing things like addressing climate change, addressing health care, addressing a growing college and automobile and home debt, or we're going to ignore those issues and go towards the sort of isolationist, less united uh, country. A recent poll by the Los Angeles Times found Democratic primary voters in California ranked climate change as their number one priority for the next president. The climate, climate is getting worse every year. Every year it's getting hotter. Uh, we're not getting rains as much anymore. Matt and Wendy Valdivia, who live in San Bernardino County, are one of thousands of Californians who have been impacted by devastating wildfires. That's my house starting to go up in flames. They lost their home a little over a month ago in the hillside fire. The memories are still raw. So I, I just, I saw it right there, just completely engulfed in flames and it was burned to a crisp. So it was a total loss? Total loss. Total everything. Everything was gone. It just makes you feel like, what was all that for? But I mean, we're alive. Matt and Wendy lost irreplaceable letters to their children and photos stored on a stranded laptop. But they also lost the sense of security they thought they had gained when they purchased their first home. They had saved up for two years to buy the house. It's still almost check to check, you know, with everything that has to that goes within a family you know you got your mortgage and then the prices in california aren't cheap either you know and that just keeps rising and rising um you got your your health care is is rising, rising. insurances too everything's you know you need insurance for everything 
The Valdivias face the kind of systemic challenges that make Senator Bernie Sanders' message resonate with them. He's, he's been there through a fight for a lot of things that weren't popular. Matt calls himself a hardcore Bernie supporter, but like all the Democrats we spoke to, he agrees the 2020 election is about more than any single candidate. And for many voters, like Jan Baird, the bottom line is clear. I hate to say this, but the most important quality is that they can beat Trump. That sentiment you just heard from Jan Baird, you'll hear from a lot of California voters. They feel conflicted between supporting the Democratic candidate they really like and supporting the candidate they think can beat a President Trump in 2020. There is a lot of anxiety about a repeat of the 2016 election here. And that's why the debate that PBS NewsHour and Politico are hosting tomorrow night here at Loyola Marymount University is being closely watched. A lot of undecided voters want to hear from these candidates to see who they will back in the end. John? And Stephanie, moving California up in the primary calendar means it's going to be the first big diverse state uh, to test the candidate's appeal. It is the biggest state on Super Tuesday, and it is the most diverse state. A lot of Latin, uh, Latino voters here, a lot of Asian American voters here, and there is not a single candidate that voters of color here are coalescing behind. I will say that the latest polls do show that Senator Sanders has an edge with Latino voters. And California is also interesting because so many of the policies that the Democratic candidates are debating right now have actually been enacted out there. Yeah, I like to say, John, that California is sort of a laboratory for progressive policies. They have the governor's mansion. They have a super majority in the legislature here. So that has meant the last two years they have passed a lot of progressive legislation. They have stricter emissions controls for vehicles here. They have stricter gun control. They recently passed a bill protecting gig economy freelancers, which is, uh, is still being debated in this state. Uh, so what you see is a lot of the uh, big ideas that we'll hear candidates talk about in the debate tomorrow night actually being enacted in this state. And for that reason, uh, Californians like to think of themselves as trendsetters. Stephanie Sy at the site of uh, tomorrow night's uh, PBS NewsHour Politico debate. Stephanie, you're going to be part of our uh, PBS coverage tomorrow. Is that right? Yep, I'll be part of the pre-show, the halftime show, and the post-show along with my colleagues. I hope everyone tunes in. Pre-show starts at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. And remember, the full debate starting at 8 p.m. Eastern on PBS stations. Roughly 300,000 people in the United States have suffered spinal cord injuries, life-changing events with far-reaching effects. But as William Brangham reports, new research out of the University of Louisville is giving dozens of paralyzed people the prospect of regaining some of what they've lost. It's part of our series, Breakthroughs on the Leading Edge of Science. For the last 10 years, this is the only way Kent Stevenson has been able to get around. He has a severe spinal cord injury, no feeling or movement below his chest. So what you're about to see is something that shouldn't be possible because doctors told him his legs would never work again. And yet, today he's back on his feet, struggling and straining to relearn how to take steps again. Let's back up. In 2009, Stevenson was a semi-pro motocross rider, but one day at practice, he took a jump, his bike seized up, and he crashed. As he was rolled into the hospital on a gurney, he got a glimpse of a future he had never imagined. Open my eyes and you could see the ceiling and it was metal, and you could see the reflection of myself. And that was when it really hit me because one of my boots was still on for some reason. I don't know why they didn't take it off, but I was like, oh boy, I cannot feel that. Stevenson had destroyed two vertebrae in his back. Doctors said he'd be in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. His career was over. I mean, that was my dream since I was little was to go do that, race that pro circuit and, and do all that. And it was, I mean, it was like, heck yeah, let's go. Because everything was in place and then everything changed that day. But in 2010, he enlisted in an experimental research program at the University of Louisville. 
The traditional view has been that when someone like Stevenson has such a bad injury, the signal between his brain and his spinal cord is permanently severed. But Susan Harkema, that's her in red, directs spinal cord injury research at the University of Louisville and the Fraser Rehab Institute. She wondered whether there was more to it than that. When a person has a spinal cord injury, as devastating as that is, it's only where the bone is broken that the neurons uh, die. But there's millions of neurons below that are still alive and can function under the right conditions. And then we know all the neurons in the brain are still there. It's just that communication network that's broken. Harkema and her colleagues ran a series of experiments using what's known as an epidural stimulator, a device typically used to treat pain. Implanted near the base of the spine, it delivers a small electrical current. They wanted to test the idea that this current could restore some of that spinal communication. But when Stevenson got his implant, he thought the whole thing sounded pretty far-fetched. I know the whole time you're just thinking, like, come on, guys, we know what the answer to this yeah. is. It ain't going to happen. You know, the little, the little gremlin over here on my shoulder, yeah, he's like, you know, what are you you're wasting your time? That was uh, until something remarkable started to happen. This video yeah. is from 2011. That's Stevenson there. He just had his uh, stimulator implanted. Remember, he hadn't moved yeah. his lower body in years, but now he's going to try. Uh. Oh man, I mean, it was, my mom was in the room, I was there, we got all eye watery and everything. I mean, I was like, oh boy, you know, now what? Where's this gonna go, you know? Because I'd just been told from, you know, day one that you just traumatically injured your spinal cord, it's, it's done. You know, it's, there's nothing. Harkema acknowledges she too was stunned at these results. She and her colleagues don't exactly know how or why this all works. The theory is, even with the most severe spinal injuries, some pathways remain intact, and the stimulator helps amplify the signal from the brain, through the spine, to the limbs. Then, to augment this effect, they use intense physical therapy to recreate what it physically and mentally feels like to walk again. You put weight back on the legs, you get them extended, you get the trunk upright, and the spinal circuitry says, oh, I know what that is, that's standing. I know how to do that. And then the circuits for standing relearn again. All you have. Nearly two dozen others have been implanted with stimulators through this program. Twelve are now able to stand upright with support. Two have been able to walk assisted over flat ground. One managed to walk nearly a quarter of a mile with breaks over the course of an hour. Other programs in Switzerland and at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota have produced similar results. Of course, it's all easier said than done. Training, in many cases, takes more than a year. Marissa Kirkling has had her implant since last summer. After a car accident left her paralyzed below the chest, she too had been told this would never happen. One, two, three. She's in the early days of learning to stand again, and she's the first to admit it's really hard. You have to be thinking as I keep talking and kind of get a little off focus of my legs. I'm losing them. So am I distracting you here? Should I go away? No, you're okay. But she's got to concentrate on every single muscle, her posture, where her feet are, not to mention answer my questions. Before my accident, you know, you don't have to really think. Like, you're standing there right now. You don't have to think, oh, squeeze your glutes, toes up, heels to the floor. So you're thinking all those thoughts right now? Yes. And, like, head up straight, neck back, shoulders back. Yeah. yeah. So, because if you don't think about them, you're going to, I'm going to buckle. But the benefits for her go beyond standing. Spinal cord injuries also impair some people's ability to regulate their blood pressure. Kirkling says hers would drop so suddenly, even getting out of bed was a challenge. Then you pass out, and then it's like, you're out. And then you just come back. And then you just have to try again. And that would happen several times during an average day? Yes. 
Yes. It just, I mean, you could be at the grocery store or the mall shopping, just sitting there watching a movie. It doesn't matter. But the epidural stimulator also improves this function. Now, Kirkling is off most of her blood pressure medications, and she can get through most days without passing out. She's also regaining her ability to sing, something else her accident robbed her of. Of course, there are still plenty of other open questions. Dr. Ali Razai is a neurosurgeon and director of the Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute at West Virginia University. It's interesting and it's exciting, but there's a lot of um, constraints that we need to look at in terms of um, not every doesn't work in everybody. So we got to understand why is it. I think being able to just get rough movements is very exciting, no doubt. But we need to translate that into functional, practical applications. Beyond that, Rizai says, there's the issue of scalability. A lot of these studies across the world have large teams, neurosurgeons, neuroscientists, neurologists, dozens of people, and the patients have to come to the hospital or to the clinic. We need to translate that to the home. Harkema acknowledges this research is still just the tip of the iceberg. We need to look at paralysis differently right now. Regardless of epidural stimulation, whether it should be a treatment or not, we know people can recover. I mean, that's clear. <laughs> For Kent Stevenson and his wife, who were babysitting their niece when we visited, it's meant dreams of an expanding future. One of my questions right out of the gate in the back of my mind was, can I have kids? You know, the physical fitness that I've gotten back from being part of the stimulator program, it, it gives me that instillment that I could be, you know, the utmost father that I was going to be before or after injury. For Marissa Kirkling, it not only means the possibility of one day standing and walking on her own, but regaining the ability to do something she loves. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change will come. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm William Brangham in Louisville, Kentucky. After a historic turnout from Generation Z in last year's midterm elections, Democratic presidential candidates are heavily courting young voters. Our Student Reporting Labs project reached out to teens around the country to find out what issues they care about and what questions they'd like to hear the candidates answer at tomorrow's NewsHour Politico debate. My name is Haskell Trige White. I'm from Beaverton, Oregon. And the question I have for the presidential candidates at the next Democratic debate is about gun violence. As a high school student, I am terrified that every day that my school will be next. What are you going to do to stop school shootings? My question to the Democratic candidates is, to those Republicans at home who are dissatisfied with the current state of the Trump administration, what can you say to them to show that you would be a president for all the people, not just those within your party? My name is Sam Oswald from Salt Lake City, Utah, and my question for the Democratic candidates is, how will your faith influence your actions in the White House? My name is Felicia Bailey from Mount Clemens, Michigan, and my question for the candidates is, what can you do about lowering the cost of college tuition? How many refugees should the United States take in, and how would you balance the humanitarian concerns of migrants and border enforcement? If DACA were to end, what would you do to help those people that are no longer being protected? Are they going to keep troops in Iraq and Afghanistan? Are they going to continue funding a war that's been going on for almost two decades now? How will you put an end to mass incarceration? And how will you put an end to white terrorism and hate crimes in the United States? How can you t uh, take on the billionaire class if you yourself are taking monies from billionaires. The national debt has doubled in the last decade to over $22 trillion. Young people of my generation are expected to bear the burden of national debt. Why do we have to pay the price of your promises? What actions will you take to protect women's rights? For example, are you going to prevent restrictive abortion laws? The question I would like to ask the Democratic candidates is how they plan to deal with big pharmaceutical companies and the current prices of medicines such as EpiPens and insulin. Should funding for mental health illness be increased for research purposes? I'm a high school student, and student stress is a really big thing. Student stress can call, cause depression, anxiety, and a lot of other medical issues. If elected, how would your environmental policy address states that have economies largely based upon the fossil fuel industry? 
My name is Angelina Hunt. I'm from Alexandria, Virginia, and my question for the Democratic candidates is, in a time where there's a lot of political division in our country, if you were elected president, what would you do to heal that divide? Good questions. You can find a preview of tomorrow's NewsHour Politico debate online. We'll be posting stories and analysis all the way through the debate. That's on our website, pbs.org slash NewsHour. And that is the news hour for tonight. I'm John Yang. Join us online and again here tomorrow evening. For all of us at the PBS News Hour, thanks. See you soon. Major funding for the PBS News Hour has been provided by. When it comes to wireless, Consumer Cellular gives its customers the choice. Our no contract plans give you as much or as little talk, text, and data as you want. And our U.S. based customer service team is on hand to help. To learn more, go to consumercellular.tv. BNSF Railway. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. PBS.